Your Highness, Sheikh Moses bin Nasser, Your Excellency, Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamad bin Khalifa Thani, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's great to see this, this uh, size of turnout for such an interesting subject tonight. Uh, I've got a bit brief background on the professor, and then we'll turn it over to him to present the lecture. Uh, professor Ahmed Hewer was a visiting fellow at the Center of Islamic Studies at Cambridge University. He's a distinguished fellow um, in Malaysia at Science Islamia University. And tonight's lecture was something that uh, was first presented was unveiled about one year ago, April of 2014, at Cambridge University. And it created a great deal of discussion and a lot of interest that drew um, scholars from across the world and several different universities to gather with the professor and really look at this paradigm a bit deeper. And I'm excited for everyone to have the chance to see it. I think there are a few of us in the room who've had the chance to see pieces of it in the past, and it always generates a very lively discussion and a lot of good uh, thought um, thinking afterwards. And, and we've always had an interesting time uh, in discussions following it. Um, it is the result of a lifetime study in the arts, in culture, and a very personal journey towards faith. And it is uh, my honor to share this experience with you tonight and to, to introduce this time Professor Ahmed Peter. Professor. Assalamu alaikum. Your highnesses, distinguished guests, friends, brothers and sisters, it's a great honor to be here once again in, in Qatar. And I always find the opening of this talk um, the, the most difficult part. I have spent a lifetime in which I started at a very young age in 1942. And during my first 18 years of life, I was educated to become a servant of the British Empire. I was the last generation. And that education was an education that completely inducted you into a belief in the supreme nature of the English mission to civilize the world. So by the age of 10, 11, 12, you really believed in it. You believe that the British were the finest that humanity had produced and were there to teach the world. When I came to the age of 18, of course, uh, it was 1960 and there was no empire. So my whole education towards that goal was completed and finished. And the 60s. My goodness, what happened during the 60s? We tore down that world that had educated and brought us into existence. There was a huge dissolution. Everything was looked into. We started seeing the other side of the coin. One of the very few things I knew about India as a child was the black hole of Calcutta. I knew nothing about the other side. So in the 60s, we really were self-educating ourselves and discovering the world. But we were also going through a great process of disillusionment. And at the end of that, by some miracle, I was introduced to the world of Islam. But I was introduced to it in a very beautiful way, through music, through the music of North India, of Delhi, of the Mughal Empire. And through that, my wife and I went on a voyage of discovery. For seven years, we put together this festival in London, the World of Islam Festival. And during that period, it was the most glorious discovery of the beauty, the goodness, and the truth of Islamic culture, Islamic, the Islamic world. And that beauty has never left me. People ask me, how, how did you become a Muslim? I, I always say to them it was through through music, food, and friendship. We weren't, we weren't seeking a religion. We were just enjoying the journey to the discovery of that beauty. And when the, the festival took place in London, there were 12 exhibitions 
which was the end of the NA, the, the uh, Arts Council of Great Britain, all the major institutions. And we had an incredible array. 6,000 objects and manuscripts which were gathered together from 250 public and private collections from, from 32 different countries. Can you imagine discovering all of this? So that was my route into Islam. Now, many years later, when I came to the age of 70, three years ago, I was asked to reflect upon my life, which is a good thing to do when you get to my age, but it's also a very difficult thing for an Englishman to do, because one doesn't really like looking back or even talking about one's past. But I was very happy that the people who persuaded me to do it really did focus on me. So you've got to do this because you've had a very interesting life and a, and, and a, and a very interesting route. And I did it, and I'm so grateful because one saw patterns, one saw a whole, a whole journey, which I wouldn't have seen, I wouldn't have understood unless I had reflected. So what I want to present to you this evening are really the fruits of that reflection. And I want to start by saying that on entering Islam, right across the Muslim world, I came across this narrative. And it was a narrative that during the European Dark Ages, there was a golden age of Islam, an age when Islam was engaged with the discovery and progress in scientific innovation. And then it came to an end, some 700 years ago. Suddenly, Dara al-Islam, the world of Islam, stagnated. And this knowledge passed into the European Renaissance, where with the scientific revolution, the modern world was created. And now the Muslims have to wake up and catch up and are part of a developing world to join those developed nations. Now this story has gone very, very deep into the psyche of Muslims all over the world. And I want to propose another story, another narrative. So if you will bear with me, let me take you through this narrative. And it starts in Christian England. Now, Christianity came to England around the same time as Islam was being brought to the Arabs, some 1,500, 1,400, 1,500 years ago. And it was brought by the saints. This is St. Augustine, who came from Rome. And the other is St. Columba, who came from Ireland the north and the south, they came. And they came into a country that had been recently conquered by Germanic tribes. And it was a country of villages, of tribes, very small world. And this world was completely Christianized. The church was the center of a complete way of life. It totally dominated. And the, the whole cycle of the year, the cycle of the months, the, the, the cycle of, the, of, of the farming was all integrated into Christianity, which gave it a complete culture. And then after 500 years, this world started to grow. And towns formed. And the church started to produce great cathedrals. Just look at the scale of this. And these saints were absolutely at the center of the society. And the most important of all was Sir Thomas Beckett. Now Beckett was martyred by the king, or by soldiers of the king. And it was because there was a conflict between the monarch and the church. But the monarch didn't win. Just look at the cathedral where St. Thomas of Becket was buried. This was rebuilt for 
his great mausoleum. And all through for the next 400 years, this is Richard II in this great altarpiece with the other martyr kings of England standing before the Christ and Mary and the angels in complete submission to the church. And all over England, these huge buildings took place. This is the great saint of the north, St. Cuthbert. And just look at the building that he was, he was buried in. Look at the scale of that building compared to what is around it. And that building took over a hundred years to create. Then we have St. Ethelreda, the great saint of East Anglia. She's buried in Ely Cathedral. And these buildings, they soared to heaven. Look at the vertical aspect of them. And every single craft was, was, was brought into the, the, the cathedral and connected up. And the beauty of it, because this was the house of God. The house of God where the people came and stood in wonder. And then, some 500 years ago, another king came. There was another battle between the king and the church. And this time, the king won. And the most incredible destruction took place. Nearly a thousand Great abbeys, monasteries, priories were destroyed. The whole central core of the Christianity in England was gutted. And the tombs of the saints were taken, their bodies were taken out, and they were scattered around, completely destroyed. The whole central core of the civilization destroyed. And after a hundred years, what was left was a translated book into English of the Bible with the king's image in the frontispiece. But what happened next was truly extraordinary. Because we now come to a great break extraordinary break that took place. We all know, we've heard the term, the civilized world. Well, this is when it came into birth. This is when it was coined, the civilized world. Christendom was the name given by the Christians for their world. The kingdom of Christ, Christendom. But what happened next was that having made a ruin of their own culture, they then dug up a world that had been dead for a thousand years, resurrected it, and worshipped it, adored it. This is when we had the term classical, the ideal, the perfection, the classical. At this moment, following the great temples of Greece and Rome, the museum was born. The place where these broken columns, these broken sculptures without arms were taken and placed in these mausoleums for a dead culture for a world that had been dead for a thousand years. And at this point, the nature of art changes. Because you see, up until then, the Christian artist had been very much a vehicle through which the whole spiritual message of that civilization passed through. 
And now you had the birth of the artist. This is Michelangelo. And the very name for artist was changed. They were now called Artifix. This was the name that Vasari, the great historian, gave them. And Artifix was a name with a term used in Christianity for the creator God. The God, the creator. So what was happening was that the artist was also now called genius. This is where the term genius appears. Because before that, genius had been a term for a familial spirit outside of the human being. But now it entered into the human being and the human being themselves became genius. So what we have is the emergence of the artist as the creator. And what were they doing? They were creating life. They were trying now to completely surpass the classical world and to produce life so that when you saw this sculpture it seemed to breathe. And of course, in terms of the subjects, the subjects of art, they became the great subjects of Greece and Rome. This is the death of Socrates. Here we have the great Socrates, Plato, in complete sadness, the disciple who is having to give him the bowl, which, is, which contains the poison, in a sense of complete despair. But what the painting is doing is the painting is showing the whole human tragedy. It's showing the human emotion. Look at the human emotion that's going on in this painting. And we've entered the realm of the human. The realm when this new term arrives, Humanism. We're into that new world in which the human becomes the focus for the artist. I'm going to have to have a small. In England, the Academy was formed. The Academy for the Artists and the form, the human form, becomes the ideal of beauty. It's the adoration of this human form. And in architecture, the work of, a, of an architect called Vitruvius, a great historian of architecture of the Romans, who did a whole work on the principles of Roman architecture, became the Bible. And whereas in the Christian, it had been an organic structure, an organic tower. Every house was different, every door was different, every window was different. And yet they all fitted together. With this new classical world, it was ordered from outside. The ordering was from outside. Everything was in lines. The, the doors were taken out of pattern books. So they were the same doors. Everything was under complete control. And this is a building in Cambridge which shows the extraordinary change that took place. Because this is a Gothic building, as you can see on the right, the Gothic building. And in front is a classical front. Because what happened? was that the, the Christian came out of their Christian culture, idealized this world that they hadn't created, that was outside of them, and found when they turned around their own world ugly. And they had to cover it. Can you imagine the world that they had created? And they called it Gothic. They called it Gothic, Gothic architecture. It's a term of abuse. Barbarians. They saw what they had done as barbarian. And 
After the fire of London in 1666, St. Paul's Cathedral was rebuilt as a Roman temple. And all over England, these huge, amazing palaces, Roman palaces, appeared in these great estates as a new class of aristocrat, aristocrat emerged. Because what had happened was that the warrior statesman had replaced the saint at the top of society as the, as the ideal. And all over London, you can see this. The great statues to the great warrior statesman. Nelson, Wellington, and the last, of course, of our warrior statesmen, Winston Churchill, standing outside the parliament. And in education, at the universities, the classics of Greece and Rome became the center of the educational system. Bible studies were separate. And you see, something very profound and something very deep was that religion and culture were separated. They became separate worlds. The culture was the culture of the Greco-Romans. The religion was Christianity. But the culture didn't worship the Roman gods. But they did adore the, the Roman myths. And they, and they adored the, the Roman and, and, and the Latin and the Greek texts. And what happened was, of course, that not only was religion and culture separated, but also, in terms of the, of the, of the people, this had absolutely nothing to do with the general people. They were left with a religion that had been reduced, but they couldn't enter into or participate in the culture. The culture was completely an elite affair. You had to be an educated man. The ordinary people had no knowledge of Greek or Latin or myths or they didn't know anything about that one. And a new narrative was born. And this narrative was the narrative of the golden age of Athens. This sublime moment where human civilization reached its peak. And then you had the peace of Rome. Following the peace of Rome, you had the fall of the Roman Empire. And so many historians have spent their whole lives working and trying to understand how did this sublime empire collapse. And then, this was followed by the Dark Ages. The thousand years of Dark Age. But as we've just seen, this thousand years of Dark Age was the age of Christian England the age of all our villages, our churches, far from dark. And finally, you have the rebirth. So within the Western mind, you already have this great contradiction between its Christian religion and its civilization, its civilized world. And two narratives which are clashing. Because in this narrative, as you'll recognize, Christ does not appear. He does not appear. And then we come to the third world that comes into existence. And this is a world that we're all very familiar with. The modern world. Now, when the Christians walked out of their culture, their organic world, and they looked at this world that was outside of them, and they idealized that world that was outside of them. They became observers. They were not inside it. And what is very important is that that world that they were observing was dead. And you can't have a conversation with a dead world. So what happened? They revived it through the imagination. 
It was an imaginative revival. That is the only way you could bring it back to life. And then the terrible thing happened that not only coming out of being inside a culture, but also coming out from being inside the natural world, mankind looked at nature as an observer. As an observer, outside of it, seeing it from the outside. And a new kind of scholar, a new type of, of, of mind was born. And that new type of mind was called a natural philosopher. A philosopher of nature, one who thinks about the natural world. But this then started to release tremendous powers because materiality is very, very powerful. And the laws of materiality, as they started to be entered into, started to really release potential. But that potential could not be realized without a marriage. And that marriage was between this new kind of thinker and the merchant. Now traditionally, the merchant performed a very basic, very simple and utterly necessary task. And that was that if you had salt and you needed salt, they would bring it from you and they would take it to them. If you had wheat and they needed wheat over there, they would move it. In other words, they were dealing with the material world, the material things that human beings need in order to support their lives. But now, with this new potential for entering into the physical material world, a huge power was released. And that power meant that we went from a craft-based world, a world of addition, to a world of multiplication. And the minute that this machine was created, the process began of having to completely transform human society and the human being. This was the beginning of machine time. Machine space, machine rhythm. But all through the 19th century, the beginning and the birth of this new world was clothed in civilization and a revived Christianity. This is the Guild Hall in the city of London during the 19th century where all the merchants are gathered during this machine age, the first beginnings part of it. And that guild hall is one of the, the relics, one of the things which survived from the Christian age. It's a Gothic building. And you see at the end the great classical sculptures. And London was a Roman city. It was a Roman city. If, Jesus, if, if uh, Julius Caesar had arrived and gone into what he thought was a temple, he would have found it was a bank. It was a strange kind of odd sort of Roman city. Because it was in America that this new world actually blossomed into a culture. And these are some of the great founders. These are some of the men who produced the great new types of cooperation, which would provide for humanity everything they required. What you eat, what you clothe yourself in, how you build your house, the holidays you take, the books you read, the programs you watch, 
your entertainment, your holidays, every aspect will be provided by these new kinds of business. And the artists pour into advertising because this is the great art of the modern. This is the art to show you this wonderful new world, to show you how you cannot possibly exist without all these marvelous new things. These are good for your health. Cigarettes, there was a time when they bleached it. And then, the shopping mall becomes the new cathedral. But we human beings cannot absorb so much stuff. We can't absorb it. But this new culture, this new culture has also now created a new way of life. And that way of life is divided between work, which is very hard, very monastic, very rigorous, and leisure, which is what whatever you as an individual wish it to be. You can watch television until your eyes drop out. You can become a football fanatic. You can go every you can to your favorite band. It doesn't matter. That's your leisure. That is your property. Paradise traditionally was what we aspired to after death. Now it's those, that place we go to which is completely unspoiled when we're released from that work. The natural world is shrinking more and more into reservations where we human beings who are no longer a part of it go to look at it. And religion is a matter of pleasure in this new world. You can be religious or you can be not religious. It doesn't matter. You can go to a church or a mosque or a cathedral. It doesn't matter. It's your private leisure activity as long as it doesn't affect work. And you see this new world, this new culture, is a culture in which where we used to mostly live in the countryside, we now move into the cities. The great movement from the countryside into the cities. As the countryside is industrialized, then the people are brought into cities. And in England, where this first happened, they existed for more than a hundred years in very mean housing. But even amongst the meanness of this housing, the communities formed. You had community. You had extended families. But then in the 60s, we replaced them. We rehoused them in the tower blocks. And this was one of the most devastating experiments. Because in that vertical world, you completely destroy the cohesion of community. You cannot have a community in a tower block. Where do the children play? Where, where are the eyes upon them? And in England, since the 70s, we've been blowing them up. We've accepted, we've accepted this as a failed experiment for public housing. But all over the world now, as this process takes place, of the industrialization of the countryside and the huge movement of populations into cities, the town blocks are going up. And the social experiment that failed in our country is doing the same thing, it's breaking communities. This 
is a part which is really very moving because you see forever human beings have lived in communities up until very recently we actually belonged to places we belonged to places we knew places we had a long relationship we had a long relationship with communities. We have, of course, a long relationship with our Lord, with our God. But in this new world, in this new culture, the process of fragmentation of first community, then of extended family, and then the reduction to the nuclear family, is taking place. That's the process of this new model. And when you get to the nuclear family, it's a very stressful family. The nuclear family is very fragile. And in America and England, we've got about 50% now of single families, single parent families. And of course, now with the whole process of uh, working on the, the concept of the individual, we have the same-sex family. So this is the, the new structure of the families, of our society. And you see, there is something very extraordinary about this. Because we talk about women and children. And what do you mean by that? Do we know what's going on? Is there any... What's that to do with this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Let me continue on because I don't need the pictures to talk, to talk this through. Um, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raju. I am now in my 70s. And this beautiful ayat, we come from God and we return to God. And when you get to my age, you start feeling that drawing towards your end. It becomes very clear. Every day, every week is a benefit, is a boon. But you start slowing down. And you start getting to the point where you have to re-enter that divine presence in a state of being in a state of tranquility. Now the children, the little ones, have arrived from that divine presence. They have arrived and the purity of them, the beauty, the wholeness of them. And for seven years they remain in that state of being, of wholeness, of oneness. And then the neuroscientists tell us that when they get to seven, eight years old, the brain goes through a huge development. And they start entering into the, the world that we inhabit. But prior to that, this seven years, it's a period when we don't teach the children to pray. In Islam, we don't teach the children to pray until they're seven. If there's a breakup in the marriage, the child remains with the, with the mother until the age of seven. And I don't think any of you, or I certainly can't, can remember that early childhood only in flashes. 
Because during that period, the child is growing its imagination, and that child is in a state of paradise. And it's protected by the women. The feminine principle surrounds that childhood. And it's not just the mother. No mother can bring out a child. It's the extended family of ladies. It's the whole community of ladies. And they protect that childhood. And because of the purity of the feminine principle, the children are protected in that state of being. And through that state of being, they can grow from inside and their imagination can grow. They live in the long duration, the long time span. But for this new world, we have created a new type of human being that is required. And that human being has been named consumer. We as human beings have been retitled consumer. And what has happened is that in order to create the consumer, in order to change the human being from living in the long-term duration to living in the short duration, the, the, the short enjoyment, the short immediate requirement of pleasure, you've got to get to the children. And so first of all, the feminine has been removed from that circle around childhood. And then the child enters in to the nursery, where the child is surrounded by things that are created by adults who are playing at being children. They produce stupid, complete plastic toys which make ridiculous sounds. <laughs> As though the children are kind of some kind of brain damaged creatures. And the children go and they see these complete things. They have a sugar rush. They're excited by it. And then they get bored. And then they go to the next. Ah. And then at the end of the day, the mother comes back tired, exhausted, goes to make the tea, and places the child in front of the television. And on the television are all these films made by adults playing at being children. Because they have no idea what childhood is. Childhood is a great mystery. So what is happening? The child is sitting in front of these idiot things. And what happens is that the child's imagination, the process of a dialysis imagination is being formed. The imagination is outside. The child is just living off that imagination and that incredible creativity which is within that first seven years of life is invaded by the adult world which knows nothing of the nature of childhood. And this disintegration of the extended family and the loneliness of old age. The old people in this new society, in this new culture, are sent off into homes. And the separation between the grandchildren and the old people is complete. And we old people need the children. We need the grandchildren because it is the grandchildren that through their being can actually help us for that return. <laughs> Completely connected. The dialysis of the imagination. 
an external force. Imagine everything is outside. The inside is empty. And this is traveled globally. And the celebrity. This is now the hero. The celebrity is now the hero of society. Not the businessman. It's a celebrity within the realm of the leisure. The world of leisure. And the Christian. He was a saint. Everybody wanted to know about the lives of saints. People were, were read about the lives of saints to encourage them. To inspire them. And then in the civilized world, it was the lives of the great warrior statesmen. It was the battles they fought to save the nation. It was Admiral Lord Nelson and his death. Huge, huge works written about it, stories told to the children. Now, what is David Beckham going to call his new child? What did he have for breakfast? I got one of David Beckham's shirts. Two, three completely separate couches. No connection. Three completely separate worlds inhabiting one Western life. It is at the center of this new world that we, we see growing around us. It's the financial district. And the financial district has completely dwarfed the old center, the spiritual center. And these financial districts are growing all over the world. They're going higher and higher and broader and broader. And the people inside it don't even know now what's going on in it. The economists don't even understand the nature of it. It's become so complex. And at the heart of this new center is the Holy of Holies, the stock market. Because the only thing that counts in this new culture, if it goes up, it's heaven. If it goes down, it's hell. That's it. This material culture, that is the absolute basis of it. Because it has to grow. It's pure materiality. It has to grow in order to live. And now, this new culture has given birth to its own educational system. The natural philosopher in the 19th century became the scientist. And the only areas that are supported in Cambridge University now are science and business. You've got to create something new, an innovation, and you've got to create entrepreneurs who can sell it. That's the fundamental structure of the modern educational system. And just to, so that there's no confusion about this, in our country, higher education is under the Department of Business, under the Ministry of Business and Innovation. We have a situation where now we have three separate systems of education. We have the modern, we have the civilized, which is that of the classics and the humanities, and we have Bible studies, religious studies. And religious studies has almost disappeared in our country, just on the very fringe. The humanities are disappearing very rapidly, and this is growing day by day. The modern narrative 
Because this new culture, this new world, has a narrative. And this is the narrative of the Big Bang. And the world was created through the Big Bang. And then we have the evolution of the species. We come from animals. The human being emerges through the chain, from fishes, etc., etc., through to human. And then we have the concept of human progress. The idea that we human beings are progressing. We're developing. Conclusion. We have three quite separate worlds with three separate power centers. We have the world of the sage scholar. We have the world of the warrior statesman. We have the world of the merchant and the world of the merchant scientist. We have three completely separate educational systems. And this is a lovely one, <laughs> which I'm going to have to try and describe to you. We have three completely different builds. Environments. The world of the cathedral, the world of the great classical school, oh my goodness. Is that me or is it actually happening? Like this? Oh gosh, what's going on? This is quite scary. Isn't it? Oh, that's wonderful. Right. And we have the, the skyscraper. The great machine building. And finally, this new modern culture is having to go deeper and deeper into the earth to sustain this growth. Deeper and deeper. It's more and more difficult to keep that growth going. The canary in the mine. Now, we used to have in, in our country, and many other countries did as well, in the mining areas, the miners used to take a canary in a cage down into the mine. Because the canary has a very little, uh, very, very small lungs. And if there was a release of gas, the canary would die. And immediately, the alarm would be given. They were the warmers. They warned the society. They warned the, uh, the miners. And they died in the process of warning. Well, uh, in terms of the world of art, the Christian art was there to inspire people towards the spiritual life. The great classical art the art of civilization, was to celebrate the nobility of the human. It was to show the, the courage, the compassion. It was to, it was to really, really uh, make people feel deeply the human condition in all its nobility, in all its compassion, in all its, its power and glory. And the art of the modern was to sell, to sell these wonderful new products. Look at this fantastic car. Free. You can go with your girlfriend or your fiance or your wife, and you can be completely free in the mountains. Look at it. The fine car at half the fine car's price. Look at the artistry of this. And then something happened. And we had modern art. Not the art of the modern, but modern art. And this is an amazing phenomenon. And one that we should understand very carefully. Because you see, what happened was that in the Renaissance, the artist became the fine artist, the academician, the artist who was the great creator. And in the 19th century, artists rebelled. 
against the establishment. Both the art establishment and the bourgeois society, which they saw as being dead, they wanted to reconnect with life. They were tired of just repeating the classical motifs. They wanted to connect with life. So these artists became rebels. They became outsiders. And all their talent, all their sensitivity to pick up, started to turn on the society itself. And they started to express who they were. They started to draw from their own beings. This is Picasso. Picasso, who was a giant across the whole 20th century, a man who was trained in the classical, who could draw anything. And this is a portrait of him when he was a young man. And then, during the Spanish War, when the terrible bombing of Guernica happened, he produced this painting showing the suffering and the horror of that event. And it's a huge painting, massive. And when it came into, when it was shown, people, the, the reaction of people said, it's horrible. And he said, yes, it's horrible. He was expressing the horror of that event. There's no glorification. It was his expression of that event. And Picasso was brought up as a Roman Catholic. Death was very close to him. But he became a, a, an atheist. He became a communist, a Marxist. He had great sense of the poor. But his, as he grew towards death, death started to haunt him. And this is the final portrait. This is his final self-portrait. And one looks at the, the terror that he captures in that face. And Picasso had a huge influence. And one of the people that he influenced hugely, who was the person who was really, uh, he idealized was Francis Bacon. Now, Francis Bacon was a, an artist, a sensitive man, who before the Second World War went to enlist. But he couldn't enlist because of his health. So he volunteered to go and work in the, during the Blitz, during the bombing of London, in the, in the people, in the group of people who were going and taking out the dead bodies and the main bodies. And Francis Bacon was a sensitive artist. And he was traumatized. He was traumatized. This man lived a life of horror. He was hardly sober. In the morning he had to get up and start drinking. He lived in a nightmare. And he expressed that nightmare, he expressed that horror in his work. This work is a work, a portrait of a friend. Imagine what he's seeing. Look at the, the dissolving horror of that face. Pollock, a very sensitive artist, a man of true very beautiful spirit. But what he was experiencing with his radar out there, he was experiencing chaos. And as that chaos entered into his soul, and he produced these works of art, which are works of art of chaos, his soul became more and more chaotic. He had a beautiful wife. His marriage was being destroyed. And the more chaos came, the more he had to stimulate himself to, 
to produce the chaos as art. And finally, in her car, with her girlfriend and his mistress, at 100 miles an hour, he went into a tree at the age of 44. He died. And the society celebrates. He's a canary in the mind. He was warning. He was telling us of the nature of our world. And what a Pallotsi. His whole work is showing how we're becoming like automaton. We're becoming like machines, robots. And we come to our present time. This is Tracy and him. This is the world of the Twitter. The world of the the world in which any idea you have, any thought that you might have inside you, you think is worth sharing. Put it out there. This is a tent which has the names of all the people she slept with. And then we come to one of the most profound and terrifying of all the artists. And this is Damien Hurst. Now Damien Hurst was born to a working class Catholic family. As a child his parents broke up. He lost his faith when he was a child. But he was young. And he became an atheist. And what he has continually shown is the atheist's vision of death. Death without redemption. That death which there is nothing beyond it. And in his work you have both the organic and the chillingly cold. This is the cycle of the fly. The fly forms, the maggots form in the head, flies around, and then it's zapped. Death. This is a story of the gradual emptying of the soul of modern man. This is the story of our soul, which the artist, because the artists don't be under any thinking that they're not artists. They are artists. They see through their eyes. They're not philosophers. They are expressing what they are experiencing and turning it into art. And in the process, they're telling us a story. And these artists, troubled souls, deeply, deeply troubled souls, are also playing out a kind of parody of Christianity. Because with the void that was left when Christianity died in our world, it was filled. Because the artist becomes the outsider the creator. Nobody understands. The critic is born. Because the critic has to tell you what it means. He's like the high priest between the, the creator and the public. And then you have the patrons who support the cult. And this is the setting of the screen. It's terrifying. This man was haunted by madness. And you think it's a scream. It's not a scream. He's covering his ears on one side of the, of the bridge. There's an asylum where the inmates are screaming. On the other is an abattoir where the animals are screaming. It's a horrifying vision. And it was bought for $130 million. And then there is a moment when there is the 
canonization of the artist. The artist joins the immortals. And this was when Damien Hurst joined the immortals. Death without redemption. Death without redemption. Dead butterflies, pills, fish. And the centerpiece, the skull. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a more poignant description of the world that we have come to? Death and money. Death and money. And Damien Hurst is undoubtedly one of the most talented artists ever to have lived. If he had lived during the time of the cathedrals, he would have been a master builder. And in terms of our world, he has shown the, the absolute essence of what our culture has become. One, you have to create something new, something innovative, which he has done. And secondly, you have to be able to market it. So don't look at this as being something strange. This is some, simply mirroring what is strange, which is our world. That is what the artists are doing. However, something very extraordinary has happened. And that is that these outsiders have now become the establishment. They've now become the establishment. They're no longer the rebels in terms of the fact of, of being the outsider. They're not. They're the establishment. So how has this happened? What does it mean? Well, look at the Buildings that have been created with the great modern museums. This is one of the plans which is put forward for the Tate Modern Extension. And all over the world, these new museums are being created. And these new museums are telling you exactly what is happening. Disequilibrium. Buildings in a continuous state of disequilibrium, of falling apart. Because you see, the artists, the modern artists, came with a very clear message. And that was a warning. But instead of us seeing the warning, we have celebrated their product. It's like somebody comes with a letter and tells you, Get out of your house, it's about to fall down. And you frame the letter and invite your friends around and look at it and say, look at the beautiful highway, isn't it amazing? Look. Because what is happening? And the thing that is most serious is the normalizing of the abnormal. The process by which, by celebrating this work, we are getting people to be able to live, to be able to enjoy, to be able to exist in harmony with disequilibrium. To be at home in a state of disequilibrium. Because the modern world is going from change to change and we can never find that equilibrium. And therefore we have to enjoy it. Get used to it and normalize it. Because look at our world. Look at the disequilibrium. Look at the chaos all around us. And it is the scientists who are telling us. They are telling us of all these problems that we face as humanity. Now, I put this picture in. It's the last few months I've been in the tropics. And this is a beautiful tropical forest. Pure. 
And it's just a pause before we go into the second part, in which I want to show that the Islamic understanding was very different. Because you see, we in the West have gone from an extreme spirituality to an extreme materialism. And in terms of Dar al Islam, it was the whole question of balance, of Nizam, that was central to this world. Now, I don't know if somebody can just, uh, just recite this ayat. Is there some. Therefore, maintain just measure and do not transgress against the balance. The revelations were brought to us by Almighty Allah in order to bring humanity back to a state of balance. That perfect mizan, when humanity has wandered from it. And the Holy Quran is a complete manifestation of this balance, this way of life of complete balance. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, actually manifested this in his being. And within Islam, these three powerful forces of the scholar, the warrior statesman, and the merchant were all contained within one culture. They all derived their inspiration from the Prophet And it was one culture. And during the 23 years of the Prophet's mission, 13 in Mecca and 10 in Medina, during that period, what was happening was that the way of life, the Islamic way of life was being formed. And just imagine, 13 years in Mecca when the whole of the outside was hostile. It was a totally hostile world. And the inner power of Islam was being formed. It's a period when the most sublime of the surahs were revealed. And then the 10 years in Mecca, in Medina, when the community was in charge where the Holy Prophet was the Amir. And during that time, the way of life of the community was formed. And that way of life was formed in a, in a period when everything was happening. The Quraysh were trying to destroy them. They were having to trade. They were farming. They were having children born and people dying. The whole of the cycle of life was taking place. But the way of life was being formed. But it was formed in a society in which everyone knew everyone else. It was a small world. And then, a remarkable thing happened. This was the world, this was the great world prior to Islam. And within a few decades, Islam conquered and covered two immense worlds. The Persian and most of the Byzantine. The richest part. And suddenly it was faced with two huge worlds in order to bring everything into one world. And how could this happen? How could this happen? Well, the first thing that happened was that the Muslims did not go into the cities. They didn't go into Damascus. They didn't go into the cities they discovered. They, they conquered. No. They produced and created their own cities. Kufa, Kairwa, Fustad. And in the process, the Islamic way of life was materialized. Because the Islamic city is the product of the Islamic way of life. Organic. Created. And you find in the Islamic city that simple exterior. 
The simple names, no great vistas, but the rich interior. The rich interior of the home and of the mosque, which so beautifully reflects the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu That simple exterior and that incredibly rich interior. And the craftsmen, the artists, supported and maintained this world. And the whole structures went out into the villages and the farming. And when we come to Baghdad, a tremendous intellectual exercise took place. And this intellectual exercise was first and foremost to create the knowledge that was required to protect and to maintain the Islamic way of life. The Sharia, so misunderstood in the West, this incredible work of actually creating a whole structure in relationship to a way of life. And of course, what happened? They were now dealing with huge cultures, with huge distances, with great administrative areas, with areas where they had to produce a tremendous amount of food, great trading areas. So what happened? They took everything that was required in terms of the knowledge that was existent. And what they did was they sifted it. They took what was required to support the way of life. They rejected which was not. And where they needed to improve, they improved. One of the areas of huge improvement was that of astronomy, mathematics. Because in Islam, the nature of direction is so important. The Qibla, direction. And how do you find it? And then the whole question of the cycle of the day, the hours, time, the cycle of the, of the moon, the cycle of the year, all of these required a huge increase in the knowledge of astronomy. And you take the astrolabe, this amazing instrument, taken from the Greeks, improved by the Muslims, but when it had reached the point where it was doing the job that it had to do, it stopped. It didn't need to develop further because it was doing what it was required to do. In medicine, the same thing happened. This great sifting, this great increase of the knowledge that was required, but always working within nature, with nature. And then you come to the machinery, again, work done on machinery, but always to deal with something which had to be functional, realized. And once that was there, that was it. There was no need to further development for it. It was doing what it was required to do. Because you see, what was central to Dar al-Islam and I say Dawah Islam because it's such a beautiful name that the Muslims called it. It wasn't Islamic civilization. That wasn't a term which was ever used. It was Dawah Islam, the abode of Islam, where Islam resides. The town, the city, the nomadic tent, the house, the village. Dawah Islam. And to maintain the balance between the forces, the human forces, which are so powerful. Example, the spiritual can take off and completely create havoc if it takes off and separates itself. The human being by nature sinks into materiality. This is one of the tendencies and the Muslim scholars were bringing them back up. And then there is the rational mind. The rational mind that has such a valuable role to play. But when that rational mind takes over and becomes the master, 
it can cause havoc on a scale beyond imagining. But we can imagine it because we can see the results of it. But in Islam, they knew from first principle these scholars because this is what they were doing continuously. It was bringing humanity back to that balance. So the relationship with God, the relationship across the community, the human relationships, and the relationship towards the creation were kept in balance. And none of these forces could escape and become extreme. And one of the great revivers was, of course, Imam al-Ghazali, known throughout the Islamic world for centuries as the proof of Islam, who ordered the whole structure of knowledge and placed it in perfect balance, a work of such magisterial property. Islam had a huge challenge. It had a challenge from the East. On the steppes, the Turkish, Mongol peoples, warriors, warrior statesmen, people who ruled great areas. And they came into the Islamic world, into Darul Islam, and they conquered and they were absorbed until this man came, Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan destroyed Baghdad, the center. And this in the narrative that I was telling you about in the beginning is one of the moments when they say Islamic civilization is over, it's stagnant, it's stopped. How can one say that? This was the world before Genghis Khan. This was Dar al-Islam after. Islam spread right across the world and went deeper and deeper into the areas that it already was the master of. And these new warrior statesmen supported and protected the Islamic way of life, century after century. And from east to west, this same process of Nizam took place. Everywhere the Muslims went, the same process of engaging with the culture that existed already, that was there, of taking from it what was a part of the Islamic way of life, of leaving apart what was not and of introducing what was needed to protect it in terms of the Islamic way of life and engaging with that natural world of that place. So this process of Nizam took place all across Dar al Islam, all across, in every different clime. Um, again. The balance, the beauty, the order, but an order that is organic, not imposed from the outside. Everywhere Islam went, it created a culture which was at hand, a dar, the abode of Islam. And the revelation was present, central, in all of these dars. And how were these dars connected? It was a golden web. A golden web which linked all these dars. And it was trade. 
It was the merchant, the great carrier of Islam, who spread right across and cities formed. So many great cities were formed with Islam, right across from Malacca, right across to Marrakesh. And the great routes which connected them across deserts and across mountains, and all linking this golden web of connections. So that every aspect, every area, every revival, every piece of knowledge would feed across Dar al Islam to all the different parts of it, and all connected through the great pilgrimage. And then there was the challenges that came from the West. Now the first of these challenges was the Christian West. And the Christians came to recover their center, Jerusalem. For a hundred years they fought. Then they left. And Jerusalem went back to the Muslims. And during that period, the whole of Byzantium was covered by Islam. The whole of Byzantium. So during that encounter, that encounter was one in which the Muslims completely covered. But then there was the civilized West. And when the civilized West came, it was a very different world. Here we had the supreme warrior states. We had the development of warfare by land and warfare by sea. We had the emergence of this other world, this other modern which was beginning to form. And a supreme power in which the Europeans produced their Roman empires, covering the earth. And when they came, two things happened. Two things happened which in terms of the culture of the Muslim world and the culture of every other culture that the West encountered were devastating. The first was that wherever the Europeans landed, they got out their buckets and spades and started digging. They arrived in Egypt. They went straight to the pyramids and they started digging. And the Egyptians were standing up and saying, we always thought these people were strange, but this is a proof of it. I mean, who goes and digs up a dead these dead worlds. I mean, only a robber. That makes sense. But they're digging these worlds up. They're taking them. They're putting these dead bodies in. This is completely crazy. <coughs> Within a generation, the Egyptians were digging. But the second thing happened. That was that you must remember the classical, the civilized, the Europeans were coming to civilize the world. And part of that process of civilization was to bring them the classical culture. And the classical buildings of the Greeks and the Romans was the perfection that was for universal application. So wherever they went, in India, Singapore, the May world, anywhere. They brought their own architects from England and they built the great buildings in the classical style. And the patronage for the traditional was completely broken. Finished. The traditional architecture was destroyed. When Abdul Wahid al Makil, the architect who was the disciple of Hassan Fati, studied architecture at the University of Cairo in the 60s, he was taught classical architecture and modern architecture. There was no Islamic architecture. It didn't exist. And the Ottomans, who had such a glorious tradition of architecture, they were so demoralized by the success of the West that they vacated one of the most beautiful 
and the most functional palaces imaginable, the Tokapu Palace, and built there Versailles on the Bosphorus in the classical style. And the living culture went into the museum, went into the mausoleum. Where the Westerner, the European, feels much more comfortable, now they can study a dead culture. It's dead. And this meant that when the metamorphosis happened and this new world emerged, this new material culture was born, there was no resistance. Crazy calligraphy. The F1 celebration. I'm told this is heavy metal. Complete replacement cities. And these cities, by the way, are not just alien in relationship to the world that they've descended upon. They're alien to all of us. They're alien to all of us. When I was in Mecca, at the Haram, in the early 1980s, they still had the water carriers who served you Zamzam. And they served you with these wonderful pottery urns, which go back to the beginning of pottery. And they were perfect. At that time, there was still sand around the Kaaba. And they sit in the sand. And as they're unglazed, the water evaporates and it keeps it cool. They're made locally. And when they die, they finish, they just go back into the earth. Perfect. Thousands of years. I persuaded one of the water carriers to let me buy it. this and I took it back and it now sits in my bedroom for my, to mark the Kibla. The next time I went to Mecca, no connection, no relationship. This doesn't come out of this, nothing, self-service. When Sinan, the great architect who built some of the most amazing mosques, imaginable huge mosques, was sent by Suleiman, the Sultan, to create the arcade around the Kaaba, which is the, one, the first one you see there, he built it lower than the Kaaba as an adder, out of respect for the Kaaba. So let me conclude. Islam, century after century after century, maintained the Mizan from West Africa right through to China. But in the short period of this modern, which is very short, very brief, each of these zones has been replaced by the modern. But the center, the core, that unchanging core, which is the great strength of Islam, that unchanging way of life, those pillars which never change, is completely intact. And within Islam is a huge reservoir of knowledge relating to balance, misad. How do you contain those human forces, which when they break out, or if they break out, can create such havoc. So at a time when humanity is groaning under the realization of a disequilibrium, when they realize that even in terms of nature, we are out of step, it is Darul Islam that contains the knowledge of that balance, 
which humanity has to recover. And what is so beautiful is that once the Muslims realized that Islam did not fail, that it, generation after generation in all countries and societies maintained its trust in maintaining that Mizan, then all the anger and the frustration and the blind fury can evaporate. And the ocean of compassion that is at the heart of Islam can be released. Because we are so fortunate. We have that center intact. We are connected to that unchanging. Because it is in the unchanging where the life is. And we see a world in which that change, 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 no center, no purpose, going towards something, and going towards cliffs. And Darul Islam has so much now that it can give. And I want to finish with something that is so awesome and so beautiful. Because you see, we are asked as Muslims to understand the signs. What is the meaning? The ayahs, what is the meaning of the Quran? But also, we're asked to understand the meaning of the creation. And look at the creation. This glorious creation that we are in. The sun. The cycle of the sun. Each day it rises in the east and it sets in the west. I've been around for 70 years. It's never suddenly decided that why oh, will it rise in the west instead of today. The same cycle. The cycle of the year. Again, summer, autumn, spring, winter, spring, everything. In this endless sequence. It's always the same framework. It's always the same framework. And we as Muslims are very aware of the cycle of the moon. It waxes and it wanes. Continuously, the same thing. And every year we see the same sky rotate. But every day is different. Every spring is different. Every child that is born is different. Every generation is different. Every tree is different. That is where the change. That is the beauty of existence. Every generation has to learn it anew. Now, 80 years ago, the scientists believed that the Milky Way, our galaxy, was the universe. That's what they believed. And they believed it was a universe that remained static. And Fred Hoyle, the great astronomer, fought hugely to maintain that belief. And then Hubble came with a huge telescope and broke through the sky. And what did he find? This is a galaxy two million light years away. Hold on a minute. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And that is 2 million light years away. How can we comprehend this? How can the human being come? And this, they found this galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. And this one is 100 million light years away. And it's 100,000 light years across. What is the meaning of this? Now, the materialist is trying to work out how it works. But for us Muslims, what is the meaning of it? How, what is it that Almighty Allah has around, allowed us to have a glimpse of what is behind the curtain? And immediately, what comes through to me is the awesome reality that there is no way that we can ever comprehend through our minds 
the wonder of this creation or how Almighty Allah produced it. And we can't live there. Let us return to that glorious world and enter once more into living in it where we can experience and be a part of the cycle of the sun and the cycle of the moon and the year and we can measure things and we can feel at home and human. And that is enough, Almighty Allah. That wonder is sufficient. No more. Thank you very much. Any questions? We have just a very, very few minutes for a few questions. I would say three questions at the most. I saw you first, so I couldn't do it. If you please just say your name and your question. My name is Naveed Ahmed. I'm a Pakistani journalist here. Uh, understand that uh, there is a scientific revolution and that changed and um, changed almost everything from Doha to Marrakesh and everywhere. Had Islam been there at the time of scientific revolution and Darul Islam was thriving at that time, wouldn't these things happen? Things would have been different. How would have Islam embraced scientific revolution in the 18th century and 19th century in your perception? I find, I'm sorry, but I'm not quite understanding the question. I can blame this on my poor English. No, no, it's not like you're pure English. It's my age. <laughs> That's not fair. My question was that when scientific revolution happens, yes. if Darul Islam was in decline. No. Uh, that's the, all, everything I've been trying to tell you is that it was not in decline. In, 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 a, in a geopolitical sense, uh, oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Ex exactly in a geopolitical, material, power, you know, equilibrium. Had it been there in that sense as well, how would have Islam embraced scientific revolution and what kind of cities, what kind of life, what kind of childhood, what kind of art we would have been witnessing in your perception? Well, look at it now. Look at it now. It's what's happened. It's been embraced. We see it now. We see it now. That's happened. Is it, hasn't it? I can't, you see, the thing is this, that all of this is the will of Almighty Allah. Of course, we know that, as, as, as Muslims. And, and things have happened as they have to happen. And our uh, duty always is to, is to try, to, is to fight for the good. And when uh, the, you know, Mecca, at the time of Mecca, they were surrounded by a, a pagan world. What, what is this world we're now surrounded by? So I, I, what I've tried to, to say is that Islam was Islam as a way of life, Dar al Islam, was not in decline. It was continuously being revived. And if you look at the evidence from that perspective, you will find it. The problem is we've been looking at the evidence from a very narrow perspective, which is that of judging it by scientific development, technological development. And that's all we've drawn out of Islam. And we try to create a story out of that. The other thing is much bigger. It's, it's oceanic in compared to a little stream. Because in terms of our human being here, being here as human beings, our duty is to maintain the balance. And that Islam did supremely, century after century, in every place. And when it was losing the balance, 
there were the great revivers. And these revivers came and they came and they came. Look at them, study them, and they're right through until the 20th century. But it's, you know, we're not seeing it. And we now need to. Because humanity is in big trouble. And I'm not telling you that. Every single scientist is telling you that. And every politician knows it. They know the problem of, of running a modern state. It's a, it's a huge problem. It's, it, you know, the, the, the people's, people of now, the maths have been released. This whole consumer thing. Everybody's been, you know, living off that now. And it's impossible for governments to provide. And it's becoming more and more difficult. It's necessary to return to this balance where humanity is, 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 is uh, fully in a state where they can live within their means and, in, and love their world and communities can be recovered and families can be recovered and children can have their childhood back. Because we are robbing them of their childhood. All of these things. And Islam has a, an oceanic knowledge of all of this. You go to Freud, you go to Adlai, you go to Weiss, Durkheim, all these people, for your social understanding. When Islam is full of the knowledge of the soul, the knowledge of the human being, No, don't tell me this thing about Islam decline. The Muslims were conquered, but they were conquered by a force which was illegitimate. It was a force in which the material overstepped the boundaries and became extreme. And that extreme aspect has turned the world into a world of utter conflict. That's the reality. And we need to discover that reality. And our leaders are doing our, their best. They're dealing with this thing, but half of it's because they're blind. The scholars are not doing their work. Sorry, I do apologize. <laughs> um, Sam Aikam. My name is Moza I'm from Qatar. First of all, I'd like to thank you. You've uh, given us hope on uh, somewhat of the distorted uh, perception that we've uh, come to believe from the stories that we keep hearing from the media. And it's like, we know it's not real, but it's so much out there that we've come to um, be, become influenced by it. A quick thank you. I'm, I'm a, um, I follow human development. And my question is, do you believe that there's hope where the West can work with um, Islamic scholars on what you have mentioned as internal state. Going back, I'm a huge believer in change from within. The West is finally coming to the notion that science and spirit is coming together from what, you know, a lot of philosophers that are working on consciousness studies like Ken Welber and like um, uh, Don Beck who was the, uh, who studies culture and cultural memes and has been with uh, Nelson Mandela and the uh, social transformation of South Africa from apartheid to peace. Do you believe that there's hope? Uh, because I, I was eager to listen to your conclusion. And uh, yes, uh, I've see, seen a glimpse of that in Dagestan. But what's ahead? What, what, what's the roadmap for the future in terms of going back to that internal state and changing our separation, our separate state the machine state to a connected one that is connected with everything to that balance you mentioned. I think it's a very, it's a very important thing. You see, uh, people say you can't go back. Of course you can't go back. We, we are in time. Um, but, but, but once one recognizes the fact of this process of disintegration, of separation, then the, all the acts, and there are so many that are happening, the acts of actually reconnecting, you know, of reconnecting. That's what, th these are the acts which you do. In terms of the future, I have no idea. But all I do know is that it's terribly important to understand the past. 
Because if one has a false understanding of the past, it can be crippling. So, if you like, the, the only thing I'm trying to do is to, is to start, a, 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 if you like, a debate on this. That we start looking at things that we haven't s necessarily looked at before. And, and my experience of Islam has been such a beautiful experience in the sense that it saved my life. You know, it saved my life. And I see such beauty in Dar al-Islam. I see great beauty here. But that beauty that you have, and you have it in the society, it comes from where you, you've come from. It's not where you're going. Because you're becoming more and more like where we've ended up. I said the same thing in Malaysia. I'm spending time with, and there's such a beauty there. There's a huge barrack in that society. But it's coming from where they've come from. And once one recognizes that, then this dependence, this di dialysis which is happening, this terrible dialysis of the West, the external thing, then the Muslim can have that confidence. Because once we open up Dar al-Islam and we start seeing the knowledge that is in it, and what they actually achieved in maintaining that human being, the human being is like a raging lion. If you if you allow it, it go off there, it go off there, it goes off there, it goes off there. And the beauty of balance is that once you have the balance, then the human being can come back, can become whole. And that's what Islam was all about. It was you know the tarif, it's, it's it's the the human being come whole, and you have beautifully your whole societies. And that's the reality, as I see it. And I'm, allowed, I'm somebody who came from the outside. I came from the outside. And I've been all over the Muslim world. And I tell you, everywhere I go, I see the same thing. And when I go back to my own country, I feel this weight entering in. Heavier, heavier. Since I, I'm 70, since my childhood, it's become heavier and heavier. Now when you talk to people, you don't know what, you know what they are. With the Islam, that scent is still there. When you meet a Muslim, when you, when you go to you, that scent is real. When you start saying things about the Prophet, so I say, you, you can feel the heart. They love him. The Muslim loves the Prophet, so I say. It's real. It's something the West doesn't understand. They don't understand because they don't experience that. They don't know what that is. And it took me time to understand it. And the love of the Quran, and the love of the hearing of the Quran, these things are intact. Completely intact. If that is intact, alhamdulillah, you have your humanity. In this critical time, when the time is so hard, it's so difficult. We should support. You know, everybody's trying, the people are trying to do their very best. And there's a huge well of goodwill. But once that knowledge is there, and they realize that Islam did not fail, Islam succeeded. And Muslims benefited from that, that strength. And the scholars knew what they were doing. You got revival, and it, things went off in bad ways. It came back to that center. Alhamdulillah. We have time for just one more. Is there a final question? Yeah, thank you. Adam Shay from Qatar Foundation. Uh, the question today is on the human development. And uh, today the scientific community is talking about sustainable age and little sustainability. Uh, give it the picture you show now, what's happening in the West and the example of Islam. Uh, do you think sustainability can be achieved through the integration of faith and science? So science is simply one aspect of a whole system, of a whole culture. And there's this tremendous desire on the Muslims of absolutely understanding the wanting to be actually and actually and try to bring the, the revelation and you know, uh, modern science together. 
but you can't extract modern science from its whole culture. It is the knowledge of a particular way of understanding the world. It's not something that is separate. That's what I've tried to show. It has a complete culture. It has a complete way of life. So when you talk about trying to connect Islam and this, they're two separate things. Now, that's, to me, the reality. How you deal with it, that's something that hundreds of minds are dealing with. But one thing that's very important to realize, and that is that the scientists now, most of the, a huge number of the scientists now, are dealing with the problems. The problems that should be created. And there's already a movement, this talk about sustainable development, there's already a movement of trying to draw back. They're trying to uninvent the nuclear.